Good afternoon. Um, on behalf uh, of the panelists here, we are very happy to be able to, we're very honored to be uh, given the opportunity to share with you our thoughts and all that. Thanks to KSI, uh, esteemed delegates, guests, and uh, I do believe there's some me media representatives as well. Um, <clears throat> before I begin the session, I see most of you are very compliant. I want to share a story, quick story with you. Um, <clears throat> this is from my friend. Eh? Just at the, uh, the start of the RMCO, this friend of mine decided to organize an event for uh, get together among friends of the tech industry. So he checked out the place, thought, okay, quite good, you know, quite well spaced up for social distancing and all that. Manatao at six o'clock in the morning, at six o'clock in the afternoon, he walked into the area. <clears throat> These are all the tech leaders, huh? they were all hugging each other and all that. He was shocked. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, that friend of mine, uh, I shall not reveal his name. Okay, so, okay. Uh. Okay, so with me, we have a illustrious uh, team of uh, panelists here. Uh, I shall not read out their uh, profile. You can read it in the printout that's given to you. Uh, they come from different backgrounds, very ac accomplished professionals and entrepreneurs as well. Uh, a lot of them are award-winning. And uh, one noted uh, observation I have is that Dr. Baskaran has just turned 70 years old. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, we want to, to look at the topic of how technology has impact healthcare. We want to look at particularly uh, 5G and AI, notwithstanding there are other enabling technologies as well. So the panelists are free to um, share their thoughts around other areas as well, and if possible, around areas of COVID-19 as well, if possible, yeah? So without further ado, let me start with uh, Azran first to share his thoughts. Each of them would have six minutes, eh? Thank you very much, um, Alan. Yeah. Cool. So allow me to share with you the biggest problems and opportunities that we see in healthcare. And I appreciate that there's a lot more, but what are the things that we're focusing on? What are the things that we're looking at this industry and saying, there's gotta be a different way of tackling this. Number one, this is an industry that today, whether you are seeing a physician in person or you do it via a telemedicine model, it's a one-on-one -on -one model. It is reactive, meaning someone has to get sick and reach out for help, and it's transactional. I go on a per-consultation basis. The reality is today, 70% of all conditions are chronic. It requires an ongoing and structured support, and this one-on-one -on -one model and transactional model is going to be obsolete because you can't get people healthier by just simply a one-off visit, a one-off prescription, a one-off treatment. The second problem that we see is that there's a big disconnect. Healthcare is very siloed. You see a cardiologist, she's gonna to talk to you only about your heart. You see a gastroenterologist, it's just about your gut. You see a psychologist, it's about your mind. You see a dietitian, it's about your food. But the reality is these conditions are deeply interrelated. There's a strong correlation between depression and diabetes. There's a strong correlation between anxiety and uh, heart diseases. And we need to think of a solution where healthcare professionals are working in a team rather than in silos. And lastly, today healthcare is based on activities. I pay per consultation, I pay per treatment, but it's not based on outcomes, it's not based on results, it's not based on whether people genuinely get healthy or not. And that is a problem in an industry where healthcare costs are growing at double digit rates and we're not able to think of a way where payers can get results for performance. Because there's no point going to see medical treatment again and again if you're not going to get healthy. And so for us, we look at this problem and it's, we say, look, we've got to start with an outcomes-based approach. We've got to quantify things. Take mental health, which, which, which think is deeply interrelated with general healthcare. We've got to approach it not just as some unique thing, but something that we can quantify. Right? How do we quantify levels of depression, anxiety, and stress? And how do we deliver outcomes in a quantitative manner? And what's interesting is the same people who are wrestling with depression, anxiety, and stress 
Turns out they're having the same issues with diabetes and hypertension and high cholesterol and obesity, right? And so we've got to address these things in a, in a manner that, you know, can change the way actuarial models work and risks get priced and people can actually pay for results rather than paying for activity with no guarantee that people are going to get healthy. So it's really time for the industry to change. Now, how do we do this? So the great thing about technology, and I'm not going to get into what we do, right? But it's collecting micro digital signals, footprints over three, four, six, 12 months that allow data to be processed and, and treatment to be done completely differently. We build a behavior change prediction model where we looked at all the digital footprints, the words that you say with your healthcare professionals, the answers that you give in modules, the journal entries that you put in, and we try to quantify your mental state. We quantify your mindsets, your resilience, your readiness to change, and use it to predict, are you likely to get healthy or not, right? And so therefore, for healthcare professionals, for the very first time, they can see the journey of readiness to change. Change is not linear. People go through ups and downs. And if we can display it quantitatively, a healthcare professional knows when someone is on a downtrend, I need to spend a lot of time to focus on turning them around. When they're self-motivated and they're going up, I can back off and, and come back. Even with mental health, because we have an ongoing relationship through text, we can apply natural language processing and identify points of distress. So if we can predict when someone's emotions crashes, this is an actual 32-year-old Malay woman a professional who through a process of just talking about what she eats and, and what she exercises, subtle changes in words were picked up. And when we reached out, she expressed, thank you for reaching out to me. My husband's been traveling a lot. I'm stuck home with the kids. The kids are sick, pressure at work. It's performance appraisal season. I was thinking of ending my life. She did not reach out for help, but we reached out because we predicted that there was a state of emotional distress. And so if we go to a future where we can start to predict, we can start to proactively engage, we can make a difference rather than waiting for people to reach out for help, waiting for people to pick up the phone call because that reactive model belongs in the 20th century. And so we can either choose to decide whether we're the taxi driver in the world of Grab, we're the Blackberry in the world of iPhone, or we're the blockbuster in the world of Netflix, or we can reimagine healthcare in a completely different manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arsan, for giving the time and very enlightening presentation on, uh, I picked up the word micro digital signals, footprint, yeah. It's very interesting, yeah, very interesting because I'm just going through an actual situation of a friend's daughter who is going through such a roller coaster ride. Yeah. So it's very, it seems groundbreaking. Thanks. Uh, we move on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Gana Baskaran. He is the president of MME. Doctor? Put some chairs like this. Let me let my I like to show my face so that I can believe I'm 70 now. First of all, uh, thank you very much, KSI and uh, Tansri Michael Yeo and the team for inviting me. Such delight looking uh, members, so intelligent. I've been invited to talk on artificial intelligence. I don't know why they call me. If artificial insemination, I would be good at talking. <laughs> they must have thought that because being doctors, having spent five years in medical college and having served the government, we must be very intelligent. Here's a fallacy because we have 14,000 members in MMA. And since the thing came about AI, 5G, everything, Zoom, GIM and all that, this morning having a Zoom meeting, now it's all about us. So we are struggling. But luckily, I have learned something before coming uh, as the president of MMA. So I am actually, if you ask me what is artificial intelligence, I may not be able to speak very well. But unfortunately, I am not here to speak very much on artificial, but I'm going to tell you how difficult it is for people, senior members to get into all this. But we can't run away from the fact we are teaching our members. And I think the basic thing is, I don't like to prepare something and come. I like to speak from my heart. I think that's more easier to talk to you because then you will realize, the younger people will realize how difficult it is for us to... When I got my first smartphone and I was trying to do all the thing, I was asking my children to help me. You know what they said? You are technically zero in your head. 
So they said, you have to learn. So I had to press everything, break that, you know, and all that. Finally, I learned something. Now I'm going into better things. Zoom is the method I love. Because I love to see Zoom. Because I can see everybody. And for the first time in the history of 60 years of MMA, we're going to have an AGM attended by 10,000 members at one go. For those who are interested, contact me on the 25th and 26th of September. Always, you know, we got a lot of doctors. Doctors are always busy in their life. They won't learn all this. We only want to learn how to take care of people. That's why I asked our DG just now, though we have a very good relationship, I asked him, what is the role of MMA? What's the role of GPs? We were not given the opportunity to play a major role during the COVID infection, neither earlier, neither future, I'm thinking. Or for all those who became doctors, I would suggest go and do other business. Get your degree and do other business. I like to learn technology from all the, all the important people. Virumandi next to evening, next me was laughing at me. I think he must have thought this fellow got nothing to do. I'm earning 10 times more than him. <laughs> okay, I, I need to speak some sense at least in the meeting, isn't it? Okay, AI and 5G. I, I actually, honestly, I must credit with my staff who did the research for me. I'm actually picking up from what I learned, but I came talking to a few people, what is uh, AI and ISG and all that. Huh? We have to learn something. I think future technology brought by 5G will make health communication more resilient and will open many new healthcare opportunities. Remote surgery, implantation, implantable devices, point of care testing, robotic surgery. All this you all know, I think. Eh? I don't think to elaborate on it. Not because I'm intelligent to elaborate. If you ask me the wrong question, I won't be able to answer. This will open a new era of advantage for all of us. Surely with this kind of COVID infection, which I think is not going to end in the next two years. Once this ends, another COVID-20 will come. And for your knowledge, I become the COVID-19 extended president in MMA. In the last 60 years, MMA has never had an extended president. I've been extended till next month, uh, 23rd, uh, 26th. So I'm known as the, historically known as the COVID-19 president of MMA. Advances in big data, ubiquitous computing, semiconductors and nanotechnology are creating profound opportunities for disaster recovery coordination Epidemic prediction, valuation, new medicine, and large-scale DNA sequencing to detect human genetic variation. Now, I don't know what you understood. I understood very little in this. I know you can, yeah, we all are young people. When you grow my age, you know. But definitely, I understand what is it all about. The future is no more sitting down with doctors. I know you love to touch. I love to touch my patient. Nothing like the touch. In my practice of being a GP, I can make a lot of compassionate things while being with them and touching them, talking to them. Now I'm going to advise them over the media. I'm going to advise them over AI and all that. It is not the same, but we have to live with reality. I cannot run away. And I think this is going to be the norm for all Malaysians or all, all over the world soon. Now AI, artificial intelligence, healthcare system based on AI, machine learning and probabilities models have potential to provide therapeutic recommendations. Prognosis learning, personalized real-time uh, scoring. I hope, uh, I'm not a uh, AI robot-assisted therapy and surgery. Medical robots and computer-aided surgery have great potential to fundamentally change the nature of medicine and surgery. They work as the patient to speak, information-driven surgical tools that empower the surgeons to treat the patient with great safety, reduce morbidity, and improve efficiency. Benefit of 5G and AI, patient care will be improved with low physician workloads and reduced cost. The extended transmission of multi-sensorial data, including robotic touch, haptic feedback will improve the overall experience of real-time remote interaction and consultation. Well, the following are some areas you to consider as part of your main points. In your area of work or life, which 5G and AI application impress you most. Describe briefly, oh, this is all going very long. Google search is enough for you to, Mr. Google answers all my questions. A lot of, a lot of patients don't visit us. They go into Mr. Google, Dr. Google, they get all the answers. They come and sit in our clinic and ask for our questions. They question me after my medical college studies. Doctor, I heard about you, have you heard? So if I'm not open-minded, if I just restrict myself to allopathic medicine, I'm finished. I have to know TCM, I have to know ACM, BCM, GCM, everything I must know to answer my patient. But this is how the world is going to be. And no doctors can run away. GPs in this country are 7,000. We are 65,000 doctors. 
government service has 40,000 doctors. It's growing every year, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. So you have any children, I don't think many of you are looking here. If you have any children, tell them to do other business better than medical business. Ladies and gentlemen, I think, uh, am I in time? Okay, before I go, I'm very good at, uh, uh, more than medicine, I'm very good at politics. I was an ex-politician who didn't make it successfully. So when I see a mic, I get very touched by the mic. I like to hold on to the mic. So don't uh, feel sorry a bit. I'm sorry because they only gave me six minutes. I would have loved to speak for 60 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gana. Uh, that was a very good uh, candid uh, sharing and a, a very good attempt at giving a keynote. That was very good. You have uh, sort of summarized what 5, 5G and AI can do. Um, yeah, and I, and I, you alluded to one thing very, that's very true, is that we need to, in, at least in my mind, uh, I, I wonder whether the other panelists will share this as well, that technology is just a tool. Right? At the end of the day, we still need human touch. How? It's either by physical touch or any other uh, touch that we can, uh, you know, uh, convey to our patient or to our friends. Uh, next, we'd like to add, uh, get Maran to share with us his thoughts. Hi, good afternoon, uh, and thank you, Ellen, and as well to uh, KSI for having me to represent Dr. On Call at this uh, forum. So um, firstly, let me introduce to you Dr. On Call. Our mission is to provide affordable, accessible, as well as high-quality healthcare by leveraging on the power of digital as well as business innovation. Our second mission is actually connect the payers be it our 11 insurers, uh, four TPAs, multiple state governments, to the providers who are providing the healthcare services themselves, right? And we have hundreds of doctors, specialists, and pharmacies, as well as allied medical professionals. And we do that by the provision of tools and technology to them. We started off our journey uh, by introducing telehealth, back in 2016 and 17, and continuing that with medication delivery. And we moved on to uh, observing that the area of provision of health content, basically through blogs and forums, especially in Bahasa Malaysia, right? Which, is, which caters to an underserved market. So I, I venture you to try looking for Kencing Manis or Darah Tinggi and Sakit Kepala in, in Bahasa. And you wouldn't find too many credible health content providers coming from Malaysia. We have about a million people visiting us on a monthly basis to access those health content and then go on to perform their consults. Since COVID-19, we have introduced specialist telehealth services as well as lab booking services. And this is to, as part of our product extension to enable specialists and uh, labs as well as allied medical professionals get on to the digital health world. So I'd like to, at this point of time, demonstrate to you our personal experience during COVID-19. When we were approached by Kementerian Kesihatan, um, the Office of uh, Tan Sri, as well as the Ministry, the Minister, to provide our digital health platform uh, for the fight against COVID-19. So that's when we actually had ringside seats to the real battle from both the informational perspective as well as the medical consultants or doctors providing their services. We had a traction of about 5 million Malaysians visiting us during that two months period, mostly to read content on COVID-19, right? Uh, there were a lot of misinformation at that point of time regarding symptoms and, and when do you get treatment, and we then extended to providing a self-risk assessment, uh, which reached out to about 2.1 million Malaysians. And it was done across multiple languages, including Nepali, uh, aside from the, the main languages, Nepali, Bahasa Indonesia, Tamil, uh, Myanmaris. And finally, the consults, either done through telephone or video consults, which were host, uh, manned by the family medicine specialists, as well as private healthcare professionals. So the reason why I'm 
narrating this example and the numbers, 40 over 1,000 consults being done at that point of time and about you know, 8,000 people being referred to uh, for testing, is to demonstrate to you the power of technology to provide healthcare at scale and in an economical fashion. I mean, being many of you being healthcare providers would, would understand that providing 5 million people with information, not consults, and, over, and tens of thousands of people with uh, consults with medical professionals in a short period of time, in an economical manner, would be hard to fathom. And with that, it sets the stage for the introduction of AI, right? So why AI and why would 5G transform healthcare? So I was also fortunate uh, along my colleagues to, uh, to have interactions with Babylon. Uh, the AI uh, pioneer back in the UK, in, in UK, as well as Ping An Good Doctor. So we visited them over in China prior to COVID, obviously. And um, we saw how they were doing 700,000, 1 million consults on a daily basis, right in front of us, on, on those big boards, right? The ticker boards that showed the number of consults. And, and them explaining to us how they they perform the triaging, right? Um, asking those questions and then feeding those information to the doctors to ultimately offer their diagnosis or prescriptions. But to do 1 million consults a day, you might say it's China, so they got a billion people, but in a fast aging population and such a you know, vast country, it's hard to imagine how to provide such services without the use of AI. I have a video, but I'll skip the video on the power of AI, but to go on to show you the PowerPoint slide. Um, we were back in November um, involved with U-Mobile in a 5G uh, prototype and demo to show how we could provide a mobile clinic that could, ex that could be situated in the remote locations and yet, through that, be able to provide accessible healthcare. So if you have the slides up there, you'll be able to see how um, on the first example, on the far right uh, or your left, you'll be able to see how um, it's a mobile clinic, right? It's, it's you know, a portable uh, clinic that could be uh, positioned over in a rest stop or in a surau or masjid out there in an internet community center. But importantly, on the far left of, of mine, as well, or far right of yours, on the top, you'll be able to see how a patient can perform a consult. And through leveraging on uh, devices which are connected and transmitting data through the 5G connection, it could then provide information in real time, be it uh, blood pressure, readings, uh, the oximeter, the thermometer, as well as even the glucometer and various other devices to the doctors sitting out there, maybe in, in, in their respective clinics, and then offer you know, credible uh, advice. So we had conversations earlier about how can you provide an immersive experience to the patient, and you can do that step-by-step -step manner by introducing new tools, be it a video call, along by marrying that along with, the, uh, with devices that can relay the information to them. And Obviously, uh, it was in the 5G Langkawi session, so we had Tun M and the likes of uh, the ministers demonstrating that, and along uh, in recent time, Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah. So these are just examples on, the le on leveraging on AI as well as 5G to extend healthcare to the patients out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mara, for sharing that uh, experience about deploying AI and all that. Uh, just to remind the panelists, uh, every the, according to SOP of this panel, every minute that you run over time, you need to contribute one thousand ringgit to the National COVID Fund. I'm just joking. Okay, <laughs> every minute. <laughs> anyway, okay. Next, uh, we'd like Dr. Arjun to share his uh, insights. Alan came up with that rule just just before he passed it to me. So thank you so much. Man. Um. Uh, just before I start, I just want to tell you that uh, two things I've learned sitting next to Alan. One is never say yes to a speaking engagement after lunch. Really tough crowd. Second, remind me not to say a yes again when it's after Tansri, uh, Dr. Norisham. Really challenging. 
My name is Azrin. I'm the founder of a company called Sadania. We're publicly listed. We're an innovation house. Uh, what we do is we use technology to empower sustainability to humanity. Uh, so previously, we've done so many things in disrupting uh, verticals like financial industry, telecommunication industry, um, power industry, uh, media. And today we're talking about um, how to uh, disrupt the health industry, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, just so that everybody understands, uh, while I was doing financial and telecommunications in, as in uh, using technology to disrupt, uh, it was still high PE. Today, the financial services is doing 8 to 10 PEs and uh, telecommunications at 20. Whereas the uh, health industry, uh, you are all professionals and you're probably going to make a lot more money after this, is that uh, it's now averaging at about 150 to 250 PE. So I'm very happy to be here amongst uh, doctors and uh, health practitioners. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about three things today. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, trends, um, technology, and consumers. Um, first, trend. Um, I strongly believe that while a lot of people in this room are probably uh, venturing into collaborative fintech, meaning uh, engaging with uh, doctors and hospitals on how to uh, provide a better service, uh, I think um, there will be a birth of disruptive fintech uh, exponentially very, very soon. And that's because uh, learning from the other industries I've learned from, um, whenever the, you have a lot of pain points in a particular industry, it's just a matter of time that technology helps to really change the way things work. Uh, it will change the way the playing field is and where it is. Uh, at the moment right now, I can tell you, I think uh, healthcare is super expensive. Uh, it's delayed, um, I mean, uh, error prone perhaps, and I say that with a lot of respect uh, to all the doctors in this room, and uh, I think it can be a lot more convenient and easy, very dissatisfying as a patient. Uh, because of that, I think disruptive in, uh, health tech will be very, very uh, prevalent uh, very, very soon. The other trend I think will happen is um, a lot of the industry players are doing a lot more reactive in tech, uh, reactive health tech. Um, um, that's trying to fix what's already broken. I think there'll be a lot more movement towards proactive uh, health tech uh, that ensures more stability. I think the consumers of the future wants a better guarantee that I have a more holistic and meaningful life. And I think what Azran is doing uh, is testament to that direction. Uh, second, technology. Uh, I just want to tell all the doctors in this room, please do not be wowed by, by the word technology. I think doctor was trying to Google what BDA and AI means and what 5G really means, uh, please don't be wowed. It's just like any other technology, whether it's IR 1.0 or 4.0 or 5.0, it's more of a brand than it's technology. Uh, to put in a layman's term, 5G is just having a colossal amount of pipe that allows a lot more bandwidth and therefore data can be sent. And what it does, it helps you to just do a lot more stuff remotely and with mobility. So you don't have to be where you need where you need to be, where you can do a lot more stuff there. And because of that, um, things like, I don't know whether you've heard about IoT, Internet of Things, uh, which in, in this industry means you can put a lot more remote uh, sensoring, uh, or remote monitoring, um, and then you can gather a lot of data, then you can get big data analytics, then you can harvest the data, then it becomes, business intelligence, actionable items, and then that's where artificial intelligence comes in. Uh, because you can uh, put uh, programming to it and it will be able to detect and it will be to tell you some of the repetitive stuff, the boring stuff. Uh, if, if you leave it to human, maybe you have 3% error, but if you give it to a machine and do machine learning, you will not do any error. So basically what AI is, doctor, is that it it empowers the ability to give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. That's what AI basically means. But it's just technology. So don't be wowed because uh, this brings me to the third point, which is consumers. Um, whatever is the technology yesterday or today or tomorrow, um, it's always about the consumers. Um, yes, healthcare was born way before internet was born. And healthcare was born way before mobility was born. Uh, so you, the industry has huge, huge legacies 
that needs to be looked at uh, either from a operational or administering of, of drugs or right up anti regulatory, uh, but that needs to be disrupted so that we can bring the rights of a consumer uh, to its rightful place. So, and here's the third point. The third point is that a lot more focus shouldn't be on the technology, but should be a lot more on the consumer. And in this case, patients. I think the experiential and the journey of a patient is numero uno. Uh, the patients of before were not as fussy. They'd be willing to queue up for five hours to get to see a doctor. The patients of today, maybe an hour. The patients of tomorrow says, I want it now. Uh, the patients of before don't mind being expensive. Today, maybe a little bit, but tomorrow, I want to pay as cheap as I can. So these are some of the stuff that needs to be looked at and technology will enable to empower that. The one thing I want to leave before I, I pass it on to Alan is um, consumer demand don't change. The demand for good healthcare and health service and affordable healthcare and health service is the same 50 years ago, today and tomorrow. It's the way people consume those health services are the one that has evolved. So like I said, like doctor, when you, you know, I, I don't mind seeing you five, uh, five, ten years ago and queuing up, but today I'm sick or I, you know, I want to talk to you today. I need to talk to you now. Uh, you know, telemedicine, uh, is the way to go. And I think 5G empowers that. And that's just using technology to disrupt or support or collaborate with the industry to move with the quick, fast changing consumer behavior. So today I'm really looking forward to learn from uh, all the intelligent people in this room. Uh, I hope to be smarter as I leave this room as before I came in. Thanks. Thank you, Dato. It's always uh, a pleasure to listen to Dato because he's uh, short, concise and uh, insightful. So, and also thank you for demystifying technology. Eh? Because in the tech sector, we like to always come up with all the buzzwords. So don't be so scared of it. Eh? Next, we have uh, Ricky to share with us from his perspective. Thank you. Um, do we have the clicker? Is it? Thank you. Very good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the insightful uh, uh, sharing just now. Uh, yeah, it's after lunch and I hope everyone is still awake. So I'm Ricky, I'm from Green Packet and Kippo. I'm here to share with you guys uh, a use case of how we adopted AI. Uh, in helping the government to to manage uh, public health care uh, on two, two, two areas. One is uh, for uh, contact tracing, and the other one is for temperature tracing, and how we apply uh, AI technology in, into schools as well. I think my slide is not out. Right. Okay, so... Um, the whole COVID pandemic actually started uh, during this whole Chinese New Year season, and um, that actually kick-started our, our first initiative. Sorry. Yeah. To actually uh, deploy, help the government to deploy um, the first uh, deployment of the uh, AI thermal sensors at our airports uh, at KLIA and KLIA2. So when we deployed that uh, in the first place, um, the public was... Uh, pretty much concerned about what's going to happen, and MCO hasn't even been announced yet nah, during that time. So uh, it was the first use case whereby we deployed, I think about two cameras in KLIA, in KLIA 2, and it was the first time the, the Malaysians uh, travelers were experiencing the whole SOP process. Um, just to share with you guys, uh, <clears throat> uh, during the, the uh, March 16, uh, my family personally traveled back from Taiwan uh, and uh, they experienced this whole MCO announcement for the first time and it was quite worrying to see everyone uh, panicking at the airport. So what we did uh, later on was actually to come up with more products and services uh, to actually uh, share more uh, in terms of the uh, AI biometric technology and how we can deploy our uh, facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous to say I'm among very distinguished guests. So you allow me to catch my breath. Okay. All right. <laughs> Chill, huh? Okay. So um, 
What we did since March was uh, we deployed a series of AI thermal scanners and a campaign called We Are Ready. Um, and uh, just to share with everyone, the, the three important roles of technology that we rolled out uh, basically focuses on three aspects. Number one is detection, basically to help detect anomalies, which is the temperature screening, uh, and also uh, to deploy contact tracing so that we have a record of all the people uh, that enters a premise or a facility. Right? Uh, and we have a, a program uh, in the solution as well to manage prevention, whereby um, we have other additional services that link into the solution to actually uh, deliver you uh, services and uh, in terms of payment and also uh, commerce uh, services. In response, uh, we have a connection that tied back to the Ministry of Health um, to actually alert the authorities in the event uh, of the, uh, if any anomalies has been detected. So the issue that that uh, that we have seen in the market in in the situ in the uh, situation right now is that um, using manual temperature detection as a single point of temperature measurement uh, has a lot of inconsistency. Um, how many of you have been to a shopping mall whereby the security guard does not even show you your temperature reading, right? Uh, most of the time, uh, it's just been perceived as a. a, a, a uh, what do you call it, inconvenience to the public uh, in terms of SOP is concerned. So what, what we want to do is to automate that to make sure all records have been captured properly, right? Uh, in different uh, verticals, uh, whereby we have different SOPs for shopping malls, uh, clinics, uh, hospitals, uh, factories, and even construction sites. So, so with, with automation in that area, what we have seen is that um, data are captured more accurately uh, and it has, reduces the human error. Right. So uh, we use a AI thermal scanner um, device, which you can see at the entrance of the uh, um, uh, conference. And uh, I don't know whether you guys are, uh, know about this. In terms of the AI biometric thermal phase recognition technology, um, the forehead alone uh, consists of more than 110,000 points uh, where the camera actually reads on to detect the temperature. And of course, with facial recognition, there's more than 200,000 points around your face that you can recognize as who you are, right? So um, that is a, a, a fraction of a time that it takes for a security guard to scan your temperature. Uh, and we deployed this in the hospital uh, not too long ago um, in HUCAM, whereby the queue uh, that it took visitors to visit hospitals usually takes about half an hour to uh, 45 minutes in the morning. Um, and after deploying the thermal scanners, it actually reduces the time by, by five times, right? Where more, more and more patients get to enter and, and get access to the services much faster. And since March, um, we have actually made uh, more than 4 million scans um, in all the places that we report in. Um, we have uh, collected uh, data of more than 1.5 million people uh, passing through uh, hospitals, uh, shopping malls, and even schools, right? And we have deployed the thermal scanners in more than 1,000 buildings, right? So far in, in the last four months, we have come up uh, an automated SOP processes, including health declaration forms, and also SOP processes uh, for nine sectors, you know, including constructions, uh, public areas, as well as uh, um, uh, primary and secondary schools, right? So what we have learned um, in the last four months is that number one, um, control needs to be digitalized. Um, and and digitali digitalization needs to happen from an administrative level where uh, currently right now we are assisting a lot of hospitals uh, and also uh, public health uh, um, uh, uh, providers to actually digitize their existing administrative <laughs> process. Uh, number two, um, there's a need for cashless communities because people do not want to handle cash uh, and three, there need to be a centralized data analytics uh, uh, facility whereby uh, all the public health data and information is being shared publicly among all segments. So this is the current uh, solution rollout that we have rolled out for hospitals right now. Um, and uh, basically it's a, it's a simple uh, cloud-based solution whereby it helps hospitals to actually run the operations uh, uh, remotely, uh, whereby it improves the patient's experience where they can actually pre-register, uh, fill up their health declaration forms earlier, uh, and even uh, have access to their medication uh, via an online uh, e-commerce uh, model. 
And uh, with this solution itself, uh, it also helps the ho uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare professionals to actually manage the administration of their internal staff as well with all the data. Right. So um, that's all I have to share today. Uh, do sorry for my uh, anxiety. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, right now, what we have for buildings management is is also another simplified solution. We roll out free of charge to a lot of our properties. Uh, our clients right now where they're using this platform to actually manage access um, and uh, and come up with controls uh, for their uh, gas registrations. Yeah, All right, thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Uh, quite impressive technology. I was just joking with Otto Azrin. Uh, I submitted my photo, which was taken about a year ago. I thought, how come they can still recognize because I have less hair now? So, uh, so it's 110,000 on your forehead, not behind there. Eh? So anyway, yeah, so without further ado, next uh, panelist, we are quite okay on time, uh, Dr. Sanjeev. Okay, good, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to the panel. Um, so so I'm, I'm Sanjeev from AstraZeneca, uh, and I, I want to talk about three things. So one is the purpose uh, uh, as, as a company. Uh, second is how uh, how AI and healthcare are coming together uh, uh, in, in this changing world. And third, uh, third, I would focus on some examples uh, so that to make it a little bit real. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would say, you know, as an industry uh, in this unprecedented time uh, during COVID, our purpose has never been so relevant. And AstraZeneca has a purpose. We push the boundaries of science to deliver life changing medicines. Uh, and and during the day we we heard about the patient centricity and whatever we do is to ensure we uh, keep patient at the at the center of of everything um and i think uh, the way pharmaceutical industry or biopharmaceutical industry is seen uh, they think about us as a treatment and not as as looking at the whole journey and for for us we have we are making that strategic shift uh, from a traditional focus of being treatment focused and and that just bringing the medicine our focus has been uh, changing to make this uh, uh, the whole holistic starting from prevention diagnosis and up to wellness and that has been our our real endeavor to ensure that uh, we focus on the holistic disease treatment rather than only focusing on 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 uh, on, the, on the treatment part uh, and i think uh, we we uh, we really believe that this is not possible alone it is important that we collaborate and i think it's great to see so many uh, different partners here where we can come together for, for the patient and we can come together to bring that science to the HCPs who can deliver that science to the patient. And that's where I believe this today's platform is making that different uh, difference, uh, you know, to us. So some, uh, to give you some, uh, some example on, uh, you know, how we are, how, um, I, I'll not focus on 5G, but I'll focus on artificial intelligence and give you some examples there. And uh, so just to tell you in healthcare, AI is really changing. Uh, and many of my colleagues would know much, much more than, than uh, in, uh, from our perspective. But, uh, but from, uh, from, uh, from an AI healthcare perspective, it's really changing and we're making really scientific discoveries, uh, new medicines and really manufacturing them from an AI perspective. Uh, it allows us to improve the way diseases diagnosed and, and patients are being treated. And that's, that's the core uh, message I want to say that our focus is to see the whole patient journey and not focus only on, on the treatment part. <clears throat> um, and the second piece uh, is around collaborating and working together. That, that means we need to exchange information and AI and big data is an important piece. Uh, but if you were to be uh, successful in our efforts, we need to ensure the data is stored in the most secured way. Data privacy is important, right? It's an artificial intelligence, everybody's sharing data. But if you don't have a secured way, people will not share the data. And if data is not sure, we can't make a good sense of it. So artificial intelligence is so important uh, from, a, from a data perspective. That means we need to ensure data are collected in hospitals, clinic, and even from personal devices stored in a uniform format because that will make a lot of sense. And only by ensuring that um, we can securely keep the data, we can use artificial intelligence in the best way possible. And I think the second piece, which were also discussed today was about trusting, uh, trusting the data. And we need to ensure that people need to trust the data will remain private and secure. If, if nobody feels it's not private and secure, nobody will use that uh, though nobody will give that data and will not be used in the best possible way. So that's the, these are two important, important pieces, I would say, is from an overall overarching perspective for AI in healthcare. 
Um, just to give you some example, what we are doing uh, as a company, uh, we are industry leading in uh, in in this and harnessing harnessing digital technology. Let me give you some examples, and and you will see these examples are really across the patient journey rather than focusing only on on the treatment part. So first is we are actually working with. Uh, benevolent AI to accelerate the identification of potential new drugs for complex diseases. That means we are really talking about when the drug is being researched and using AI at that point of time. And uh, treatment is coming later, but we are using a technology uh, at that place uh, and complex diseases like kidney diseases. So that's number one. And so we are combining AstraZeneca's expertise, which is about our science, and AI technology, which is somebody else expert. So we're coming together to use two uh, expertise uh, to uh, do the target identification. Uh, then the second point is how are we using the efficacy of new drug uh, candidate through clinical trials? We are now able to collect 70% of the data we need from home uh, from a variable sensors and which we were talking about so that means how efficiency we are bringing through this data again we're an early early part of patient uh, patient journey which means that for patient it means fewer visits staying at hospital for patient are lesser and less disruption in their life so that's how we are already using this as an example and thirdly even manufacturing digitization is reducing the use of natural resources physical labor and waste so we're using AI to optimize the maintenance of our production lines so that we can prevent the breakdowns rather than fix them when they are happening. So that's that's really changing the way we are using AI. And finally, I, I just another example, which is more latest one that we are working with the University of Cambridge, uh, having developing a tool that uses AI to support COVID-19 patients. So really, uh, a, a, as an example, therefore, I, I'm, my key message is that as a company, our purpose is patient following the science and delivering the science to patient. We believe we don't have to focus only on treatment part of the journey. We need to fo focus on whole part of the journey. AI can bring that difference uh, to the patient, but it's not possible that we do it alone. We need to work with partners who share the same passion uh, together as a company. Right. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, for sharing with us your company's journey in widening your scope of uh, services to your uh, to the consumers and how technology is helping you to do that. Um, I'd like to open the floor for questions now. Uh, do come forward to the mic to Ask question. Introduce yourself first, and, and quickly ask question if you can. So we have an esteemed panel of uh, speakers. Please do uh, tap onto the knowledge and uh, experience as well. Perhaps while waiting for questions on the floor, may I quickly just ask the panelists? Maybe you can share your thoughts about how you view your kind of work that you do versus other countries in the region or, or globally as well, perhaps you want to share. Sure, Alan. Um, of all the different parts of the healthcare um, flow or ecosystem from those who are doing diagnostics and doctor booking and drug delivery and, and personalized prescription, uh, where we focus on behavioral health, we think that's the one part where localization really matters to understand not just language, but culture and lifestyle and, and the context of the, the providers and the payers in that particular market. And so it has to be really tuned to in, in the, the personalization of delivery. For example, in Indonesia, we can't take our team here to serve Indonesian clients. It has to be done by an Indonesian team, likewise Thai, likewise Vietnam, etc. So the behavioral health function is, has to be the most localized in terms of health delivery. Thanks. Anybody else? Sure. How do you uh, compare uh, Malaysia's adoption of technology in healthcare versus other countries? In Malaysia? I, I think uh, obviously I've learned something today coming here, and Dato Azrin has made it very clear. I think technology-wise, I think Malaysia is also in the, in the foremost field. I don't think we are lacking in any aspect. But how much of usage by the local medical fraternity is what is uh, ma making us worry. But I think, as you said, there's no choice. I want to touch my patient, but it's not going to happen soon. So more and more, the people are going to ask you questions and they're, they're more intelligent than the doctors themselves, huh? patients. So we have to be very updated, upmarket on the technology-wise. And that's the reason why 
as the largest medical organization with 15,000 members, don't talk about the 65,000 doctors in the country, we have created a platform, we have created a, you know, we a medical uh, association, we are restricted by ethics and all that. But we have created a cooperative movement where we are opening up the field to a lot of companies, they are coming and joining us to be our partners. And we just received a 2 million investor who just come into our company. So I think in the future, if this is going to be the way, then we have to move forward. We have told all our members that you cannot run away from technology, AI, or you know, 5G and all that. And they have to learn something, whichever way possible for them to learn. Thank you. Just, just to add that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm told that a lot of the participants in this room are doctors, right? No, no, not many. No, no? Okay. Uh, well, healthcare practitioners, be it the technology or not. Uh, I think if you look across industries now, uh, you start to realize that a lot more professionals and executives are being made irrelevant. Uh, whether you went to school and studied law, or you studied accountancy, or you studied to be an engineer, or an architect, a quantity surveyor, a town planner, some of those professions are starting to be less relevant. Uh, I engage with these, you know, associations of town planning and engineering and architecture. I hear stories of how of all of the architect firms, only two are surviving, the rest are closing down. It's the same with engineering and all that. So this is a calling to all healthcare pr practitioners that if you think that, you know, studying five years, doing housemanship for two years and then posting one of the five years and doing a specialization and you come up, you're hoping to earn 30, 40,000 a month. Those days are probably the generations of before. I don't necessarily think that it will be sustainable unless you make it relevant. And the ability to make it relevant comes from you, which is the ability to unlearn some of the stuff that you, you thought you knew and relearn some of the stuff that needs to change because your patients, which is the consumers, are getting fussier. They have a choice. Uh, technology makes it more pervasive. And therefore, if you don't change and evolve together with them, they will go and find somebody else to subscribe to. Can I also add, like, um, what we've observed, and I think you can just, you know, read the, the future, right? Is, um, you know, Malaysia is a very fortunate space where we pretty much got COVID-19 uh, under control. Uh, we have a great infrastructure. We have uh, what many around the region and around the globe also see as, you know, very qualified uh, healthcare professionals, uh, a trusted healthcare system, right? Uh, medical tourism is, is growing rapidly in Malaysia. And um, we can leverage on digital health, right? And, and all this technology about AI, 5G, and telemedicine, you know, to actually use it to leapfrog our healthcare uh, industry. So um, being, you know, in Dr. Ankor, we observe patients calling in from, you know, various parts of the, the globe, right? Being our neighbors in Indonesia or Thailand or even Myanmar, and Bangladesh, Singapore calling in to talk to medical professionals over here uh, to seek medical services around here, um, largely because of all the ingredients I just mentioned to you. So, so rather than you know having a pessimistic view on how you know this industry is taken over by technology, we can use it actually as a real you know advantage for ourselves to go out there because the Malaysian brand is pretty strong and has just gotten better because of COVID-19 and the way we manage it. So I think um, we, we should really train our medical professionals to adopt all of this and just go ahead, right, using data analytics and, and go out there and again, win the, win the medical uh, business for the war. Just quick and Sanjeev. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, uh, as we see in Malaysia from today's discussion, we clearly see there's a very good appetite uh, to shape this ecosystem. Uh, and, and the COVID has really uh, uh, showed us that there are a lot of possibilities to to change the way uh, we uh, we treat the disease or maybe even prevent the disease. And I think AI and 5G could could help uh, in, in really making it possible. Um, and, and I think that today's discussion about uh, you know the prevention part and the diagnosis part, which is so so very critical, and also in the primary care ecosystem. Uh, the way we are, uh, are diagnosing or preventing the disease will clearly change. Uh, and Malaysia is one of the places where we see all the partners coming together and creating that ecosystem. So I think, uh, I think it's the it's a right time uh, for us to collaborate and come together and help shape the, shape the ecosystem 
uh, for, for the benefit of the patient. And I think two places I, I, I would want to say uh, are possible with the 5G and AI. So one is emergency services. We can actually use 5G to bring real time data so that we can, we can help patients to get the acute emergency services. And second thing is how do we ensure that we bring prevention? So if we use the technology for, uh, for, uh, uh, for emergency services with 5G and real time data, and use the AI technology for prevention, I think we are already starting to shape this ecosystem combination. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, questions on the floor? Yeah, hi, I'm Sanjeev from Kodan University. I would just like to ask the panel that, you know, um, we are seeing a lot of problems in uh, where compatibility is becoming an issue. We talk about 3G, we talk about 2G, we talk about 5G, but we know even our phones nowadays are not compatible within two years. Lifelong, we have a lot of issues with that. Do what do you see? Where are we heading in terms of the medical devices? When such technology is catching up, how are we going to talk about affordability and also accessibility in the coming time? Second question is also in relation to the fact that we know it's unfortunate that we don't have the public sector to present the other panelists, but there is a lot of discussion around Personal Security Act data protection and so forth. When you're having so much of data and there is, you know, not much use of that big data right now, but we hope that we will, this will change in the future. How do you negotiate that with the government? How, how would you, you know, ensure that kind of security for, I mean, imagine now, even though we like it or not, our face is on every other camera every other day. So how does person security act come to face? Lastly, but not least, behavioral modification that we are seeing from the technology. I'm really impressed to hear what you just shared with us just now. But are you also considering AI modeling to pick up this kind of profiling between countries where you can pick up this issue beforehand so that you don't have to do actual face-to-face -face when, you know, recognizing that kind of issues? Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe as you know, as you want to check the last question first. Uh, the two questions that the, the last the answer to the last question is yes we're even detecting differences between singaporeans and malaysians in terms of anxiety triggers and stress triggers which is really fascinating yeah as usual uh, i'll try to do number one um don't worry uh telecommunication industry is very very competitive so uh either from the hardware perspective uh, the price will actually continue to go down as penetration goes up uh, and maturity of the industry, as well as the bandwidth provision, uh, it will go down. So when you talk about connectivity, it's not just 4G or 5G. There are various, various ways on how to connect. You have um, MBIOT, you have um, WiMAX, you have all that stuff, right? So don't worry about that. On data protection, uh, that's a tough one, actually, um, because um, governments may try and say that the data protection, uh, you know, non-intrusion of your privacy and all of that stuff. But at the end of it, uh, it's still in law, it still needs to be navigated together with the law of public interest, for example, or security of a nation or sovereignty of a nation, for example. So when that, when that clashes, uh, the latter uh, prevails. So in short, if you, are, if you watch the movie Matrix, <laughs> If you're plugged on, uh, yeah, data protection app will help you to a certain way. Uh, but beyond that, um, public interest and government's interest uh, will have to outweigh that personal uh, interest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I suppose, you know, this is the right time to have uh, conversations with the regulators uh, around regulations. Because, uh, you know, regarding your question number two, right, about, about data, um, being, being on the early, adopt, uh, early you know, leads in this, in this space and amassing data. Um, I, what we observe is the fact that you know, the right conversations, the right questions uh, are not being asked all this while, right? And, and at this point in time, when we are on the cusp of a, a real major right, uh, shift in uh, the adoption of technology by the healthcare pro uh, providers, uh, Ministry of Health has rightly so started the, the conversations with the online health yeah. services uh, framework uh, set of discussion. Uh, they have some really great people uh, who are running it. And I think it's really good for all the professionals out there to start getting engaged 
uh, as well, big public or professionals get engaged with Ministry of Health, specify what you want to have. Because, you know, we, we have a lot of people who are storing data on, on WhatsApp. So doctors have been conducting WhatsApp, uh, you know, consults for years, right? And having pictures, sensitive information on that. Uh, we, we have, you know, uh, multiple institutions with paper uh, records, not under lock and key for years. And, you know, you have, those individuals turning around and asking about healthcare, uh, data, security, um, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, the pot calling the kettle black, right? So we should really have correct conversations about standards. And if you look at the US, with Kipa, or China, the standard, it's been set and forced, and it then allows the industry to thrive because the key elements of trust is, is there, right? And I think this is really the time for us to, to have those conversations. Maybe last comment before I summarize it. Yeah, I think I agree about the standards uh, when it comes to data protection. Uh, today, um, we are connected to about 500 schools uh, where we are collecting data from, I think, more than 100,000 students, right? Um, including the parents' details and so on. Um, and this is with reason. With reason. Um, when we first deployed the technology, we have a lot of arguments, uh, debates from healthcare professionals or even from, from anyone, from parents that comes in and say, you know, uh, do you have right to, to store my picture, my contact info and so on. But when we lay on the, lay out the case to them, saying that when school reopen, if there's a case detected in schools, right, and when that student uh, is exposed to other classmates, and when they go home, and when they interact with their family members, and of course you have parents who work in an office. So if we, if we look at the big picture, it actually spreads down to four to five degrees and it impacts a few hundred people from this one student who's exposed, right? So from, from a contact uh, tracing perspective, um, we do seek permission um, from the users to actually allow us to keep their data and to contact them in case we notice any anomalies. I think it's, it is, it is the, the parameters and the rules that we set around how we use data. Uh, consumers today use data protection very loosely. Uh, you can upload your face into a, what's the hottest thing right now, the face swap, right? You load up, you, 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 you connect your social data infos into your social apps and you share your data uh, and your face information loosely. But when it comes to serious items like this, um, I think I think we, we have to all have a consensus that you know uh, within reason, uh, within the right parameters, we, we, we do allow certain access uh, to some degree of personal data. And I think I don't think the MOH or our government will actually abuse this data uh, from from what we have seen so far. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I need to wrap up this session. Uh, if I may, very quickly, uh, just a couple of summarizing points. One is, uh, it looks like technology will help us to, to face better days for healthcare. Uh, on a personal level, perhaps be wise in use technology uh, because, uh, for example, I always say that the phone is smart, but we are supposed to be smarter than the handphone, right? Okay? I can tell an example. Uh, for example, we cannot be too dependent on handphone. Imagine one day you don't have waste. It's going to be, if you're not careful, it's going to be all hell break loose. You need to do the traffic. So as you use waste, watch the signs and all that that you do. You don't completely rely on waste, for example. So be wise to use technology. Uh, Corporate-wide and so national and community-wide, I think there's call for collaboration. Yeah. Uh, so just remember technology is a tool. We still need human touch. We still need collaboration, without which uh, it won't work. So let's remind ourselves of all this. So thank you again to all the panelists and for your attention and your question as well. Thank you so much. A big round of applause to the